Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the Entrepreneur Power Hour Saturday Night Personal Development Series. I am your co-host, Chris Peters, along with my brother and co-host, Green Mays. And we have our third panelist, Mrs. Frances Richardson, here with us tonight. And this evening, we are going to be continuing our book study course for Think and Grow Rich, Chapter 7. Tonight, we're on organized planning the crystallization of desire into riches. So I'm going to start the recording now, and then after, we're going to brainstorm what we learned from this chapter and some stuff we can do to apply it. So here we go. Chapter 7, Organized Planning, the Crystallization of Desire into Action. The Sixth Step Towards Riches. You have learned that everything man creates or acquires begins in the form of desire. That desire is taken on the first lap of its journey from the abstract to the concrete into the workshop of the imagination, where plans for its transition are created and organized. In Chapter 2, you were instructed to take six definite practical steps as your first move in translating the desire for money into its monetary equivalent. One of these steps is the formation of a definite practical plan or plans through which this transformation may be made. You will now be instructed how to build plans which will be practical. Viz. Ally yourself with a group of as many people as you need for the creation and carrying out of your plan or plans for the accumulation of money, making use of the mastermind principle described in a later chapter. Compliance with this instruction is absolutely essential. Do not neglect it. Before forming your mastermind alliance, decide what advantages and benefits you may offer the individual embers of your group in return for their cooperation. No one will work indefinitely without some form of compensation. No intelligent person will either request or expect another to work without adequate compensation, although this may not always be in the form of money. Arrange to meet with the members of your mastermind group at least twice a week, and more often if possible, until you have jointly perfected the necessary plan or plans for the accumulation of money. Maintain perfect harmony between yourself and every member of your mastermind group. If you fail to carry out this instruction to the letter, you may expect to meet with failure. The mastermind principle cannot obtain where perfect harmony does not prevail. Keep in mind these facts. First, you are engaged in an undertaking of major importance to you. To be sure of success, you must have plans which are faultless. Second, you must have the advantage of the experience, education, native ability, and imagination of other minds. This is in harmony with the methods followed by every person who has accumulated a great fortune. No individual has sufficient experience, education, native ability, and knowledge to ensure the accumulation of a great fortune without the cooperation of other people. Every plan you adopt in your endeavor to accumulate wealth should be the joint creation of yourself and every other member of your mastermind group. You may originate your own plans, either in whole or in part, but see that those plans are checked and approved by the members of your mastermind alliance. If the first plan you adopt does not work successfully, replace it with a new plan. If this new plan fails to work, replace it in turn with still another, and so on, until you find a plan which does work. Right here, is the point at which the majority of men meet with failure because of their lack of persistence in creating new plans to take the place of those which fail. The most intelligent man living cannot succeed in accumulating money nor in any other undertaking without plans which are practical and workable. Just keep this fact in mind and remember when your plans fail that temporary defeat is not permanent failure. It may only mean that your plans have not been sound Build other plans. Start all over again. Thomas A. Edison failed 10,000 times before he perfected the incandescent electric light bulb. That is, he met with temporary defeat 10,000 times before his efforts were crowned with success. Temporary defeat should mean only one thing, the certain knowledge that there is something wrong with your plan. Millions of men go through life in misery and poverty because they lack a sound plan through which to accumulate a fortune. Henry Ford accumulated a fortune not because of his superior mind, but because he adopted and followed a plan 
which proved to be sound. A thousand men could be pointed out, each with a better education than Ford's, yet each of whom lives in poverty because he does not possess the right plan for the accumulation of money. Your achievements can be no greater than your plans are sound. That may seem to be an axiomatic statement, but it is true. Samuel Insel lost his fortune of over $100 million. The Insel fortune was built on plans which were sound. The business depression forced Mr. Insel to change his plans, and the change brought temporary defeat because his new plans were not sound. Mr. Insel is now an old man. He may consequently accept failure instead of temporary defeat, but if his experience turns out to be failure, it will be for the reason that he lacks the fire of persistence to rebuild his plans. No man is ever whipped until he quits in his own mind. This fact will be repeated many times because it is so easy to take the count at the first sign of defeat. James J. Hill met with temporary defeat when he first endeavored to raise the necessary capital to build a railroad from the east to the west, but he too turned defeat into victory through new plans. Henry Ford met with temporary defeat not only at the beginning of his automobile career, but after he had gone far toward the top. He created new plans and went marching on to financial victory. We see men who have accumulated great fortunes, but we often recognize only their triumph, overlooking the temporary defeats which they had to surmount before arriving. No follower of this philosophy can reasonably expect to accumulate a fortune without experiencing temporary defeat. When defeat comes, accept it as a signal that your plans are not sound. Rebuild those plans and set sail once more toward your coveted goal. If you give up before your goal has been reached, you are a quitter. A quitter never wins, and a winner never quits. Lift this sentence out, write it on a piece of paper in letters an inch high, and place it where you will see it every night before you go to sleep, and every morning before you go to work. When you begin to select members for your mastermind group, endeavor to select those who do not take defeat seriously. Some people foolishly believe that only money can make money. This is not true. Desire, transmuted into its monetary equivalent through the principles laid down here, is the agency through which money is made. Money of itself is nothing but inert matter. It cannot move, think, or talk, but it can here when a man who desires it calls it to come. Planning the Sale of Services The remainder of this chapter has been given over to a description of ways and means of marketing personal services. The information here conveyed will be of practical help to any person having any form of personal services to market, but it will be of priceless benefit to those who aspire to leadership in their chosen occupations. Intelligent planning is essential for success in any undertaking designed to accumulate riches. Here will be found detailed instructions to those who must begin the accumulation of riches by selling personal services. It should be encouraging to know that practically all the great fortunes began in the form of compensation for personal services or from the sale of ideas. What else except ideas and personal services would one not possess of property have to give in return for riches? Broadly speaking, there are two types of people in the world. One type is known as leaders and the other as followers. Decide at the outset whether you intend to become a leader in your chosen calling or remain a follower. The difference in compensation is vast. The follower cannot reasonably expect the compensation to which a leader is entitled, although many followers make the mistake of expecting such pay. It is no disgrace to be a follower. On the other hand, it is no credit to remain a follower. Most great leaders began in the capacity of followers. They became great leaders because they were intelligent followers. With few exceptions, the man who cannot follow a leader intelligently cannot become an efficient leader. The man who can follow a leader most efficiently is usually the man who develops into leadership most rapidly. An intelligent follower has many advantages, among them the opportunity to acquire knowledge from his leader. The Major Attributes of Leadership 
The following are important factors of leadership. Unwavering courage based upon knowledge of self and one's occupation. No follower wishes to be dominated by a leader who lacks self-confidence and courage. No intelligent follower will be dominated by such a leader very long. Self-control. The man who cannot control himself can never control others. Self-control sets a mighty example for one's followers, which the more intelligent will emulate. A keen sense of justice. Without a sense of fairness and justice, no leader can command and retain the respect of his followers. Definiteness of decision. The man who wavers in his decision shows that he is not sure of himself. He cannot lead others successfully. Definiteness of plans. The successful leader must plan his work and work his plan. A leader who moves by guesswork without practical definite plans is comparable to a ship without a rudder. Sooner or later, he will land on the rocks. The habit of doing more than paid for. One of the penalties of leadership is the necessity of willingness upon the part of the leader to do more than he requires of his followers. A pleasing personality. No slovenly careless person can become a successful leader. Leadership calls for respect. Followers will not respect a leader who does not grade high on all the factors of a pleasing personality. Sympathy and understanding. The successful leader must be in sympathy with his followers. Moreover, he must understand them and their problems. Mastery of detail. Successful leadership calls for mastery of details of the leader's position. Willingness to assume full responsibility. The successful leader must be willing to assume responsibility for the mistakes and the shortcomings of his followers. If he tries to shift this responsibility, he will not remain the leader. If one of his followers makes a mistake and shows himself incompetent, the leader must consider that it is he who failed. Cooperation. The successful leader must understand and apply the principle of cooperative effort and be able to induce his followers to do the same. Leadership calls for power, and power calls for cooperation. There are two forms of leadership. The first, and by far the most effective, is leadership by consent of and with the sympathy of the followers. The second is leadership by force, without the consent and sympathy of the followers. History is filled with evidences that leadership by force cannot endure. The downfall and disappearance of dictators and kings is significant. It means that people will not follow forced leadership indefinitely. The world has just entered a new era of relationship between leaders and followers, which very clearly calls for new leaders and a new brand of leadership in business and industry. Those who belong to the old school of leadership by force must acquire an understanding of the new brand of leadership, cooperation, or be relegated to the rank and file of the followers. There is no other way out for them. The relationship of employer and employee or of leader and follower in the future will be one of mutual cooperation based upon an equitable division of the profits of business. In the future, the relationship of employer and employee will be more like a partnership than it has been in the past. Napoleon, Kaiser Wilhelm of Germany, the Tsar of Russia, and the King of Spain were examples of leadership by force. Their leadership passed. Without much difficulty, one might point to the prototypes of these ex-leaders among the business, financial, and labor leaders of America who have been dethroned or slated to go. Leadership by consent of the followers is the only brand which can endure. Men may follow the forced leadership temporarily, but they will not do so willingly. The new brand of leadership will embrace the 11 factors of leadership described in this chapter, as well as some other factors. The man who makes these the basis of his leadership will find abundant opportunity to lead in any walk of life. The depression was prolonged largely because the world lacked leadership of the new brand. At the end of the depression, the demand for leaders who are competent to apply the new methods of leadership has greatly exceeded the supply. Some of the old type of leaders will reform and adapt themselves to the new brand of leadership, but generally speaking, the world will have to look for new timber for its leadership. This necessity may be your opportunity.
the 10 major causes of failure in leadership. We come now to the major faults of leaders who fail, because it is just as essential to know what not to do as it is to know what to do. Inability to organize details. Efficient leadership calls for ability to organize and to master details. No genuine leader is ever too busy to do anything which may be required of him in his capacity as leader. When a man, whether he is a leader or a follower, admits that he is too busy to change his plans or to give attention to any emergency, he admits his inefficiency. The successful leader must be the master of all details connected with his position. That means, of course, that he must acquire the habit of relegating details to capable lieutenants. Unwillingness to render humble service. Truly great leaders are willing, when occasion demands, to perform any sort of labor which they would ask another to perform. The greatest among ye shall be the servant of all, is a truth which all able leaders observe and respect. Expectation of pay for what they know, instead of what they do with that which they know. The world does not pay men for that which they know. It pays them for what they do or induce others to do. Fear of competition from followers. The leader who fears that one of his followers may take his position is practically sure to realize that fear sooner or later. The able leader trains understudies to whom he may delegate at will any of the details of his position. Only in this way may a leader multiply himself and prepare himself to be at many places and give attention to many things at one time. It is an eternal truth that men receive more pay for their ability to get others to perform than they could possibly earn by their own efforts. An efficient leader may, through his knowledge of his job and the magnetism of his personality, greatly increase the efficiency of others and induce them to render more service and better service than they could render without his aid. Lack of Imagination Without imagination, the leader is incapable of meeting emergencies and of creating plans by which to guide his followers efficiently. Selfishness. The leader who claims all the honor for the work of his followers is sure to be met by resentment. The really great leader claims none of the honors. He is contented to see the honors, when there are any, go to his followers, because he knows that most men will work harder for commendation and recognition than they will for money alone. Intemperance. Followers do not respect an intemperate leader. Moreover, intemperance in any of its various forms destroys the endurance and the vitality of all who indulge in it. Disloyalty. Perhaps this should have come at the head of the list. The leader who is not loyal to his trust and to his associates, those above him and those below him, cannot long maintain his leadership. Disloyalty marks one as being less than the dust of the earth and brings down on one's head the contempt he deserves. Lack of loyalty is one of the major causes of failure in every walk of life. Emphasis of the authority of leadership. The efficient leader leads by encouraging and not by trying to instill fear in the hearts of his followers. The leader who tries to impress his followers with his authority comes within the category of leadership through force. If a leader is a real leader, he will have no need to advertise that fact except by his conduct, his sympathy, understanding, fairness, and a demonstration that he knows his job. Emphasis of Title The competent leader requires no title to give him the respect of his followers. The man who makes too much over his title generally has little else to emphasize. The doors of the office of the real leader are open to all who wish to enter, and his working quarters are free from formality and ostentation. These are among the most common of the causes of failure in leadership. Any one of these faults is sufficient to induce failure. Study the list carefully if you aspire to leadership, and make sure that you are free of these faults. Some Fertile Fields in Which New Leadership Will Be Required Before leaving this chapter, your attention is called to a few of the fertile fields in which there has been a decline of leadership, and which the new type of leader may find an abundance of opportunity. First, in the field of politics, there is a most insistent demand for new leaders, a demand which indicates nothing less than an emergency. The majority of politicians have seemingly become high-grade, legalized racketeers. 
They have increased taxes and debauched the machinery of industry and business until people can no longer stand the burden. Second, the banking business is undergoing a reform. The leaders in this field have almost entirely lost the confidence of the public. Already the bankers have sensed the need of reform, and they have begun it. Third, industry calls for new leaders. The old type of leaders thought and moved in terms of dividends, instead of thinking and moving in terms of human equations. The future leader in industry, to ensure, must regard himself as a quasi-public official whose duty it is to manage his trust in such a way that it will work hardship on no individual or group of individuals. Exploitation of working men is a thing of the past. Let the man who aspires to leadership in the field of business, industry, and labor remember this. Fourth, the religious leader of the future will be forced to give more attention to the temporal needs of his followers in the solution of their economic and personal problems of the present and less attention to the dead past and the yet unborn future. Fifth, in the professions of law, medicine, and education, a new brand of leadership and to some extent new leaders will become a necessity. This is especially true in the field of education. The leader in that field must, in the future, find ways and means of teaching people how to apply the knowledge they receive in school. He must deal more with practice and less with theory. Sixth, new leaders will be required in the field of journalism. Newspapers of the future to be conducted successfully must be divorced from special privilege and relieved from the subsidy of advertising. They must cease to be organs of propaganda for the interests which patronize their advertising columns. The type of newspaper which publishes scandal and lewd pictures will eventually go the way of all forces which debauch the human mind. These are but a few of the fields in which opportunities for new leaders and a new brand of leadership are now available. The world is undergoing a rapid change. This means that the media through which the changes in human habits are promoted must be adapted to the changes. The media here described are the ones which, more than any others, determine the trend of civilization. When and how to apply for a position. The information described here is the net result of many years of experience, during which thousands of men and women were helped to market their services effectively. It can, therefore, be relied upon as sound and practical. Media through which services may be marketed. Experience has proved that the following media offer the most direct and effective methods of bringing the buyer and seller of personal services together. Employment bureaus. Care must be taken to select only reputable bureaus, the management of which can show adequate records of achievement of satisfactory results. There are comparatively few such bureaus. Advertising in newspapers, trade journals, magazines, and radio. Classified advertising may usually be relied upon to produce satisfactory results in the case of those who apply for clerical or ordinary salaried positions. Display advertising is more desirable in the case of those who seek executive connections. The copy to appear in the section of the paper which is most apt to come to the attention of the class of employer being sought. The copy should be prepared by an expert who understands how to inject sufficient selling qualities to produce replies. Personal letters of application directed to particular firms or individuals most apt to need such services as are being offered. Letters should be neatly typed always and signed by hand. With the letter should be sent a complete brief or outline of the applicant's qualifications. Both the letter of application and the brief of experience or qualifications should be prepared by an expert. See instructions as to information to be supplied. Application through personal acquaintances. When possible, the applicant should endeavor to approach prospective employers through some mutual acquaintance. This method of approach is particularly advantageous in the case of those who seek executive connections and do not wish to appear to be peddling themselves. Application in person. In some instances, it may be more effective if the applicant offers personally his services to prospective employers, in which event a complete written statement of qualifications for the position should be presented for the reason that prospective employers often wish to discuss with associates one's record. Information to be supplied in a written brief. 
this brief should be prepared as carefully as a lawyer would prepare the brief of a case to be tried in court. Unless the applicant is experienced in the preparation of such briefs, an expert should be consulted and his services enlisted for this purpose. Successful merchants employ men and women who understand the art and the psychology of advertising to present the merits of their merchandise. One who has personal services for sale should do the same. The following information should appear in the brief. Education. State briefly, but definitely, what schooling you have had and in what subjects you specialized in school, giving the reasons for that specialization. Experience. If you have had experience in connection with positions similar to the one you seek, Describe it fully, state names and addresses of former employers. Be sure to bring out carefully any special experience you may have had which would equip you to fill the position you seek. References Practically every business firm desires to know all about the previous records, antecedents, etc. of prospective employees who seek positions of responsibility. Attach to your brief photostatic copies of letters from former employers, teachers under whom you studied, prominent people whose judgment may be relied upon. Photograph of self. Attach to your brief a recent unmounted photograph of yourself. Apply for a specific position. Avoid application for a position without describing exactly what position you seek. Never apply for just a position. That indicates you lack specialized qualifications. State your qualifications for the particular position for which you apply. Give full details as to the reason you believe you are qualified for the particular position you seek. This is the application. It will determine more than anything else what consideration you receive. Offer to go to work on probation. In the majority of instances, if you are determined to have the position for which you apply, it will be most effective if you offer to work for a week or a month or for a sufficient length of time to enable your prospective employer to judge your value without pay. This may appear to be a radical suggestion, but experience has proved that it seldom fails to win at least a trial. If you are sure of your qualifications, a trial is all you need. Incidentally, such an offer indicates that you have confidence in your ability to fill the position you seek. It is most convincing. If your offer is accepted and you make good, more than likely you'll be paid for your probation period. Make clear the fact that your offer is based upon your confidence in your ability to fill the position, your confidence in your prospective employer's decision to employ you after trial, your determination to have the position you seek, knowledge of your prospective employer's business. Before applying for a position, do sufficient research in connection with the business to familiarize yourself thoroughly with that business and indicate in your brief the knowledge you have acquired in this field. This will be impressive as it will indicate that you have an imagination and a real interest in the position you seek. Remember that it is not the lawyer who knows the most law, but the one who best prepares his case who wins. If your case is properly prepared and presented, your victory will have been more than halfway won at the outset. Do not be afraid of making your brief too long. Employers are just as much interested in purchasing the services of well-qualified applicants as you are in securing employment. In fact, the success of most successful employers is due in the main to their ability to select well-qualified lieutenants. They want all the information available. Remember another thing. Neatness in the preparation of your brief will indicate that you are a painstaking person. I have helped to prepare briefs for clients which were so striking and out of the ordinary that they resulted in the employment of the applicant without a personal interview. When your brief has been completed, have it neatly bound by an experienced binder and lettered by an artist or printer similar to the following. Brief of the qualifications of Robert K. Smith, applying for the position of private secretary to the president of the blank company incorporated. Change names each time brief is shown. This personal touch is sure to command attention. Have your brief neatly typed or mimeographed on the finest paper you can obtain and bound with a heavy paper of the book cover variety, the binder to be changed, and the proper firm name to be inserted if it is to be shown to more than one company.
Your photograph should be pasted on one of the pages of your brief. Follow these instructions to the letter, improving upon them wherever your imagination suggests. Successful salesmen groom themselves with care. They understand that first impressions are lasting. Your brief is your salesman. Give it a good suit of clothes so it will stand out in bold contrast to anything your prospective employer ever saw in the way of an application for a position. If the position you seek is worth having, it is worth going after with care. Moreover, if you sell yourself to an employer in a manner that impresses him with your individuality, you probably will receive more money for your services from the very start than you would if you applied for employment in the usual conventional way. If you seek employment through an advertising agency or an employment agency, have the agent use copies of your brief in marketing your services. This will help to gain preference for you, both with the agent and the prospective employers. How to get the exact position you desire. Everyone enjoys doing the kind of work for which he is best suited. An artist loves to work with paints, a craftsman with his hands, a writer loves to write. Those with less definite talent have their preference for certain fields of business and industry. If America does anything well, it offers a full range of occupations, tilling the soil, manufacturing, marketing, and the professions. First, decide exactly what kind of job you want. If the job doesn't already exist, perhaps you can create it. Second, choose the company or individual for whom you wish to work. Third, study your prospective employer as to politics, personnel, and chances of advancement. Fourth, by analysis of yourself, your talents and capabilities, figure what you can offer and plan ways and means of giving advantages, services, developments, ideas that you believe you can successfully deliver. Fifth, forget about a job, forget about whether or not there is an opening, forget the usual routine of have you got a job for me, concentrate on what you can give. Sixth, once you have your plan in mind, Arrange with an experienced writer to put it on paper in neat form and in full detail. Seventh, present it to the proper person with authority, and he will do the rest. Every company is looking for men who can give something of value, whether it be ideas, services, or connections. Every company has room for the man who has a definite plan of action, which is to the advantage of that company. This line of procedure may take a few days or weeks of extra time. But the difference in income, in advancement, and in gaining recognition will save years of hard work and small pay. It has many advantages, the main one being that it will often save from one to five years of time in reaching a chosen goal. Every person who starts or gets in halfway up the ladder does so by deliberate and careful planning, excepting, of course, the boss's son. The new way of marketing services Jobs are now partnerships. Men and women who market their services to best advantage in the future must recognize the stupendous change which has taken place in connection with the relationship between employer and employee. In the future, the golden rule and not the rule of gold will be the dominating factor in the marketing of merchandise as well as personal services. The future relationship between employers and their employees will be more in the nature of a partnership consisting of the employer, the employee, the public they serve. This new way of marketing personal services is called new for many reasons. First, both the employer and the employee of the future will be considered as fellow employees whose business it will be to serve the public efficiently. In times past, employers and employees have bartered among themselves, driving the best bargains they could with one another not considering that in the final analysis they were in reality bargaining at the expense of the third party, the public they served. The Depression served as a mighty protest from an injured public whose rights had been trampled upon in every direction by those who were clamoring for individual advantages and profits. When the debris of the Depression shall have been cleared away and business shall have been once again restored to balance, both employers and employees will recognize that they are no longer privileged to drive bargains at the expense of those whom they serve. The real employer of the future will be the public. This should be kept uppermost in mind 
by every person seeking to market personal services effectively. Nearly every railroad in America is in financial difficulty. Who does not remember the day when, if a citizen inquired at the ticket office the time of departure of a train, he was abruptly referred to the bulletin board instead of being politely given the information? The streetcar companies have experienced a change of times also. There was a time not so very long ago when streetcar conductors took pride in giving argument to passengers. Many of the streetcar tracks have been removed, and passengers ride on a bus whose driver is the last word in politeness. All over the country, streetcar tracks are rusting from abandonment or have been taken up. Wherever streetcars are still in operation, passengers may now ride without argument, and one may even hail the car in the middle of the block, and the motorman will obligingly pick him up. How times have changed. This is just the point I am trying to emphasize. Times have changed. Moreover, the change is reflected not merely in railroad offices and on streetcars, but in other walks of life as well. The public be damned policy is now passe. It has been supplanted by the we are obligingly at your service, sir, policy. The bankers have learned a thing or two during this rapid change which has taken place during the past few years. In politeness on the part of a bank official or bank employee today is as rare as it was conspicuous a dozen years ago. In the past, some bankers, not all of them of course, carried an atmosphere of austerity which gave every would-be borrower a chill when he even thought of approaching his banker for a loan. The thousands of bank failures during the Depression had the effect of removing the mahogany doors behind which bankers formerly barricaded themselves. They now sit at desks in the open, where they may be seen and approached at will by any depositor or by anyone who wishes to see them, and the whole atmosphere of the bank is one of courtesy and understanding. It used to be customary for customers to have to stand and wait at the corner grocery until the clerks were through passing the time of day with friends and the proprietor had finished making up his bank deposit before being waited upon. Chain stores, managed by courteous men who do everything in the way of service short of shining the customer's shoes, have pushed the old-time merchants into the background. Time marches on. Courtesy and service are the watchwords of merchandising today and apply to the person who is marketing personal services even more directly than to the employer whom he serves because, in the final analysis, both the employer and the employee are employed by the public they serve. If they fail to serve well, they pay by the loss of their privilege of serving. We can all remember the time when the gas meter reader pounded on the door hard enough to break the panels. When the door was opened, he pushed his way in, uninvited, with a scowl on his face which plainly said, What the hell did you keep me waiting for? All that has undergone a change. The meter man now conducts himself as a gentleman who is delighted to be at your service, sir. Before the gas companies learned that their scowling meter men were accumulating liabilities never to be cleared away, the polite salesmen of oil burners came along and did a land office business. During the Depression, I spent several months in the anthracite coal region of Pennsylvania studying conditions which all but destroyed the coal industry. Among several very significant discoveries was the fact that greed on the part of operators and their employees was the chief cause of the loss of business for the operators and loss of jobs for the miners. Through the pressure of a group of overzealous labor leaders representing the employees and the greed for profits on the part of the operators, the anthracite business suddenly dwindled. The coal operators and their employees drove sharp bargains with one another, adding the cost of the bargaining to the price of the coal, until finally they discovered they had built up a wonderful business for the manufacturers of oil-burning outfits and the producers of crude oil. The wages of sin is death. Many have read this in the Bible, but few have discovered its meaning. Now, and for several years, the entire world has been listening by force to a sermon which might well be called, Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Nothing as widespread and effective as the Depression could possibly be just a coincidence. Behind the Depression was a cause. Nothing ever happens without a cause. 
In the main, the cause of the depression is traceable directly to the worldwide habit of trying to reap without sowing. This should not be mistaken to mean that the depression represents a crop which the world is being forced to reap without having sown. The trouble is that the world sowed the wrong sort of seed. Any farmer knows he cannot sow the seed of thistles and reap a harvest of grain. Beginning at the outbreak of the World War, the people of the world began to sow the seed of service inadequate in both quality and quantity. Nearly everyone was engaged in the pastime of trying to get without giving. These illustrations are brought to the attention of those who have personal services to market to show that we are where we are and what we are because of our own conduct. If there is a principle of cause and effect which controls business, finance, and transportation, this same principle controls individuals and determines their economic status. What is your QQS rating? The causes of success in marketing services effectively and permanently have been clearly described. Until those causes are studied, analyzed, understood, and applied, no man can market his services effectively and permanently. Every person must be his own salesman of personal services. The quality and the quantity of service rendered and the spirit in which it is rendered determine to a large extent the price and the duration of employment. To market personal services effectively, which means a permanent market at a satisfactory price under pleasant conditions, one must adopt and follow the QQS formula, which means that quality plus quantity plus the proper spirit of cooperation equals perfect salesmanship of service. Remember the QQS formula, but do more. Apply it as a habit. Let us analyze the formula to make sure we understand exactly what it means. Quality of service shall be construed to mean the performance of every detail in connection with your position in the most efficient manner possible with the object of greater efficiency always in mind. Quantity of service shall be understood to mean the habit of rendering all the service of which you are capable at all times with the purpose of increasing the amount of service rendered as greater skill is developed through practice and experience. Emphasis is again placed on the word habit. Spirit of service shall be construed to mean the habit of agreeable, harmonious conduct which will induce cooperation from associates and fellow employees. Adequacy of quality and quantity of service is not sufficient to maintain a permanent market for your services. The conduct or the spirit in which you deliver service is a strong determining factor in connection with both the price you receive and the duration of employment. Andrew Carnegie stressed this point more than others in connection with his description of the factors which led to success in the marketing of personal services. He emphasized again and again the necessity for harmonious conduct. He stressed the fact that he would not retain any man, no matter how great a quantity or how efficient the quality of his work, unless he worked in a spirit of harmony. Mr. Carnegie insisted upon men being agreeable. To prove that he placed a high value upon this quality, he permitted many men who conformed to his standards to become very wealthy. Those who did not conform had to make room for others. The importance of a pleasing personality has been stressed because it is a factor which enables one to render service in the proper spirit. If one has a personality which pleases and renders a service in a spirit of harmony, these assets often make up for deficiencies in both the quality and the quantity of service one renders. Nothing, however, can be successfully substituted for pleasing conduct. And that's it. That one's uh, one of the longer ones of in the book. I think that's almost 43 minutes. I'm just trying to fix this. Uh, there we go. Oh, hold on a sec, Dan. There we go. <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes, I can. Good. All right, I'm going to put my headset on and change to that microphone okay there that should sound a lot better it does sound better good all right so organized planning what did you learn tonight Dan um, 
Well, I got in a little late. Sorry about That's that. That's fine. Uh, <laughs> no, no, don't worry. I'm glad you came. We were starting to wonder if people were going to show up for Saturday, but it's all good. No, no, no. Um, I can remember if you had changed to three or if it was still three thirty. No, it's going to be was... six p.m. Eastern, so four your time. It's four right now. Oh, so, so three, three your time. Sorry. Yeah. That's okay. That's why I w couldn't remember for sure. So I jumped on about three thirty. So right, you're two hours behind me. That's right. That's right. Three hours. No, I'm central. I'm six o'clock right now, not seven. Oh, okay. Yeah. Two hours. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I think because um, I've read this before and I've gone through this before, but I think the one thing um, that um, you know, he's talking about that QQS thing, and then he was talking when he was going over a, a, about you know um, how up here a little bit where he was talking about um, media, so to speak, or you know, you know how that's going to play a big part in um, people's you know things on how they look at things and stuff like that. And I, when he was actually going over that part, I was thinking, wow, look at Twitter, look at exactly. Facebook, look at Instagram, look at, that's a driving force nowadays behind a lot of things of what people look at and what they believe or what they hear or what they learn about something Absolutely. rather than just by even word of mouth from other people mm -hmm. or by going and doing stuff online, researching and stuff, mm -hmm. you know. Um, they're going with that rather than really doing some of their own research. Mm -hmm. And that's part of our, I think our areas, you know, entrepreneurs and stuff is also to bring that out to light to, you know, make people understand that just because it's out here does not necessarily make it totally true either. Oh, absolutely. Or, or that you should just rely on it totally. You still need to, to do your, you know, yeah. your, you know, your own, looking at things and really judging, you know, for yourself, not just relying on social media or stuff and things mm -hmm. like that. And then I think it was interesting to how he's talking about, you know, like banks and stuff and things of how, you know, um, how bankers and stuff and things like that, people were treating people like the meter reader and stuff, you know, yeah. paying and stuff. but I think it, cause he says, they were changing their tactics and stuff. And I think, you know, since that time, we we went back to a lot of those old tactics, that forceful type thing, that forceful, you know, you will do this. I mean, even now with banks, you know, banks are doing things with my money and telling me I can't do things with my money, but that I give them mm -hmm. the right to use. You yeah. know, but then they're, t you know, so it's almost come full circle again. And yeah, I sense, you know, after hearing that, that and reading that, I think, you know, it's like, well, there's going to be another type of revolution. And that might be part of what, you know, like you guys and cream and, you know, Fran and people like that who are looking in, at cryptocurrency and things like that, where it takes some of that leverage out, mm -hmm. you know, some of those things that, you know, and gives the power back to people in saying what, they need to have a voice and say in. So I think it's interesting how to go and go back through this again, how relevant some of what he talks about, what he says is really relevant even today. Oh, yeah. You know, and that's what I think I'm getting out of it. Yeah, me too. I think that the importance of planning, um, like Kareem and I have a new company. Our, our company name is not the Entrepreneur Power Hour. It's Rockstar Entrepreneurial Starters is the name of our business. Cool. Which is really cool. Yeah, Sean Chun helped us with that to pick a unique name that would that ties Kareem and I together. And uh, we've got a business structure we're forming, marketing niches, and and things like that. We're building lead capture pages, and uh, we actually wrote two separate books um, that are eBooks that people can download and uh, to get a feel for what we're doing with Rockstar Entrepreneurial Startups and. Um, I actually finished my first video series today from chapter one, kicking depression's ass. Um, so we're, we're building products around the books essentially. And that's part of planning, you know, and we knew the entrepreneur power hour was, was too, um, 
vague. You know, it's too vague to try to unite all the world's entrepreneurs and, and to say we specialize in video production. Well, millions of people do, right? And to say we can do whiteboard videos. Well, millions of people do that. So we're figuring out what separates us from our competition and, and what's unique about us and what we bring to the table with all that. So that's been really cool. Um, <clears throat> but what I really feel this chapter emphasized was never quitting and planning and planning and planning and then forming new plans if something doesn't work. You go back and you plan again. You go back and you plan again until you find the correct path to get you where you want to go. That's been part of my problem is the planning and keeping on track and keeping myself going where I, I tend to go like this. <laughs> yeah. And it's big, you know, like that. And that's where I need to get it a little more smooth out and get things but I also have a lot of things going on in my life and it's been hard because it affects what I'm doing of course. and all that stuff. So it's like, uh, you know, I would love to get more definite and, you know, in my mind I have an idea of, you know, what I want and where I want to go, but to get it drilled down, kind of like what you do, guys are doing, that's where I need to work more and better and get better. Well, and once, work once, we, once we've completely learned how to do it, then we can do it for other people. So right. you'll be able to learn through us how to, how to do that. Once we, once we've got it all figured out and, and down, we can teach that to our clients and our, as well. So there you go. Oh, yeah. So, um, but I'm, there's, I could probably go on forever <laughs> out of this book because this book has so much depth it to it and so much that you can pull out of it. Um, but I need to get uh, going sure. and uh, yeah. taking care of something too. Okay, but, me too. Uh, and, uh, but, yeah, I'm glad you guys did it this week considering last week because uh, I texted you guys and you said, oh, we're not doing it. Nobody's, I'm like, okay, no problem. So I'm glad this week that um, – Yeah, we're, we're trying to keep it as consistent as we can, but sometimes stuff comes up, right? So, no, no, that happens. That's part of rolling with the punches right. and being flexible. And, and, you know, it happens at times. All right. I want to thank Dan Sissick, Fran Richardson, and Kareem Mays for joining us tonight. Uh, Chris Peters here with the Entrepreneur Power Hour and Rockstar Entrepreneurial Startups. And we will see you guys next week. Take care.